In our last lab, we put the scientific method into practice while investigating the properties of an unknown substance. Today, we will introduce you to some basic lab equipment and learn how to make proper measurements. As always, before beginning any experiment in the laboratory, be sure you are familiar with laboratory safety requirements. For a demonstration of basic lab safety rules, you can watch our video entitled Lab Safety. To perform an experiment, we need laboratory equipment. Laboratory equipment can be classified in three categories. Safety equipment, glassware, and hardware. Safety equipment includes personal protection equipment, such as a lab coat or apron, safety glasses and gloves, and other safety equipment. Next, we will discuss some basic glassware. Glassware refers to glass or plastic lab equipment used to measure, mix, heat, or transfer chemical substances. Some common glassware includes beakers, flasks, and test tubes used to hold, mix, or heat chemical substances. Graduated cylinders and pipettes used to measure liquids. Funnels used to help when pouring liquids. Glass rods for stirring and tubing for transferring liquids or gases from one container to another. All other equipment used in the lab is called hardware. Hardware includes a balance for finding the mass of a substance, meters such as pH meters and digital thermometers, burners, ring stands, rings, clamps, tongs, and racks for holding glassware. Scientific instruments and people who use them are imperfect, so errors in measurement can occur. To help minimize errors, scientists must take extra care with measurements. They often take multiple measurements to ensure both precision and accuracy. Precision refers to the smallest accurate measurement that can be made with a measuring instrument. Accuracy refers to how close a measurement is to the correct value of that measurement. To demonstrate precision and accuracy in scientific measurements, we will use graduated cylinders to measure an exact volume of a liquid. To obtain an accurate measurement with a graduated cylinder, we must know how to read the markings on the cylinder. A graduated cylinder has horizontal marks evenly spaced along the height of the cylinder. The marks indicate volume in milliliters. Look at the liquid in the graduated cylinder with your eyes level with the surface of the liquid. Notice that the top surface of the liquid is curved. The curved surface of a liquid in a container is called a meniscus. A meniscus is formed by the surface tension of a liquid and by the attraction of liquid molecules to the molecules in the glass container. With most liquids, the surface curves downward in the center, forming a concave shape. When measuring the volume of water and most other liquids, read the mark closest to the bottom of the meniscus. In this instance, we see that the graduated cylinder has 22 milliliters of liquid. Each of these graduated cylinders contains the same volume of a liquid. Let's determine which graduated cylinder will provide us with the most accurate and precise measurement. Now, let's look at our largest graduated cylinder. It can measure volumes up to 1,000 milliliters. The 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder is marked in increments that are 10 milliliters apart. Since the markings are 10 milliliters apart, it is precise to 10 milliliters. Scientific measurements are usually considered accurate if they are precise to a certain value with one additional estimated decimal place. All the figures of a measurement that are precise plus one estimated last digit 
are called significant figures. If we look closely at the level of liquid in the graduated cylinder, we see that the bottom of the meniscus is below the lowest marking on the cylinder. Therefore, this graduated cylinder cannot be used to measure the volume of the liquid. Let's try a 500 milliliter graduated cylinder. It is marked in five milliliter increments, so its precision is five milliliters. Since the increments are smaller, this graduated cylinder has a greater precision than the 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder. If we look closely at the level of liquid in the graduated cylinder, we see that the bottom of the meniscus is below the lowest marking on the cylinder. Therefore, this graduated cylinder cannot be used to measure the volume of the liquid. This graduated cylinder can measure volumes up to 100 milliliters. It is marked in one milliliter increments, so it is precise to one milliliter. This graduated cylinder has a greater precision than the 500 milliliter graduated cylinder. We may be able to use it to achieve a more precise measurement of the liquid's volume. The bottom of the meniscus is about half the distance between the 42 and 43 milliliter mark. So we estimate the volume to be about 42.5 milliliters. This measurement is more accurate than the previous measurements, but we can be even more precise. This graduated cylinder can measure volumes up to 50 milliliters. The 50 milliliter graduated cylinder is also marked in one milliliter increments. So it has the same precision as the 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. Since both graduated cylinders are precise to one milliliter, which one should we use? The 50 milliliter graduated cylinder has a smaller diameter than the 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. The smaller diameter makes the markings on the 50 milliliter graduated cylinder farther apart than the markings on the 100 milliliter cylinder. Markings that are farther apart make it easier for us to estimate the last digit of the measurement. Once again, we see that the bottom of the meniscus of the liquid is between the 42 and the 43 milliliter markings. Using the 50 milliliter graduated cylinder, we estimate the volume of the liquid to be 42.4 milliliters, which is as close to the exact amount that we can measure with this equipment. Not all liquids produce a concave meniscus. Look at these two graduated cylinders. The one on the right contains exactly 22 milliliters of liquid mercury. The one on the left contains exactly 22 milliliters of colored water. The meniscus of mercury curves upward in the center, forming a convex shape. The meniscus of water curves downward in the center, forming a concave shape. When measuring the volume of mercury, read the mark closest to the top of the meniscus. But when measuring the volume of water, read the mark closest to the bottom of the meniscus. Suppose you are following a recipe that calls for 240 milliliters of water, 30 milliliters of oil, and 10 milliliters of vanilla along with flour, milk, and eggs. However, the measuring cup you are using is only precise to 100 milliliters. Unless you're extremely good at estimating volumes, chances are your cake will not turn out the way you planned. It is important to make measurements as accurate and precise as possible. Errors in measurement can cause unexpected results when baking a cake or performing an experiment. If you were to add 20.5 grams of trisodium phosphate to 13.7 grams of hydrochloric acid, the chemical reaction would produce 21.9 grams of sodium chloride and 12.3 grams of phosphoric acid. Chemicals that are combined to produce a chemical reaction are reactants. 
Chemicals that result from a chemical reaction are products. If the exact amount of reactants are not used, the chemical reaction will not produce the expected results. Earlier, we said that precision refers to the smallest accurate measurement that can be made with a measuring instrument. Precision has a second definition in science. Precision also refers to how close measurements are to one another when multiple measurements are made. When taking multiple measurements, it is important to be both precise and accurate. It is possible for a set of measurements to be precise but not accurate, or for them to be accurate but not precise. Suppose three groups of students measured the volume of liquid in this cylinder. In an attempt to be accurate and precise, they measured the volume three times each. They recorded their results in a table, and here is what they found. Each measurement made by the students in group one was exactly the same. So their measurements showed high precision. However, each of their values were 0.5 milliliters off from the actual measurement of 33.4 milliliters. So their measurements showed low accuracy. They may have made the mistake of reading the top of the meniscus instead of the bottom. The measurements made by the students in group two differed from each other. So they were less precise, but their measurements were closer to the actual value, so their measurements were more accurate than the first group. These students' measurements showed low precision but high accuracy. Their inconsistent results were most likely due to reading the markings without being at eye level with the surface of the liquid. Finally, let's look at the measurements made by the students in group three. Their measurements were the same each time, and they were correct. These students had high precision as well as high accuracy. If the students in groups one and two had been as careless with measurements while performing an experiment, their experiment might not have turned out correctly. It is important to be both accurate and precise when making measurements in the lab. In our next lab, we will discuss the properties of elements and compounds, and we will demonstrate thermal and electrical decomposition of certain compounds. At this time, please proceed with the corresponding activities. <laughs>